Good evening aspirants I welcome you all to another video of the series Shankar summary but before getting into the discussion I have two important announcements to make one is that we are resuming the Hindu daily news analysis from 15th of May 2023 we have been getting a lot of messages from you to resume the analysis again we are really happy that many of you have been following the series continuously so keep supporting us as always and the second thing that i wanted to share is that the free all india mock test of shankar ias academy is starting soon there are three tests and these three tests will be conducted on three days that is 7th of may 14th of may and 21st of may 2023 these tests are simulated based on upsc standards also answer keys and explanations will be given after each test so gear up and get ready for your d day so with this note now we will take up the discussion so these are some of the topics from october 2022 current affairs have a look at it now we will take up the first question for a discussion see this question reads which of the following statements are the main features of central bank digital currency statement number 1 it is a sovereign currency that central banks issue in accordance with their monetary policy statement number 2 on the balance sheet of the central bank it is listed as a liability statement number 3 it is freely convertible into cash and money from commercial banks statement number 4 holders of cbdc do not need to have a bank account because it is a fungible legal money statement number 5 it is anticipated to reduce the price of issuing currency and the cost of transaction which of the statements given above is that are correct first we will see some basics about cbdc then we will get back to the question see cbdc that is central bank digital currency is a legal tender issued by rbi in a digital form it is same as the fiat currency and is exchangeable one on one with fiat currency only its form is different it is not a paper like physical currency it is a fungible legal tender for which the holders need not have a bank account cbdc will appear as a liability on the rbi's balance sheet now please don't confuse e rupee with e rupee both are different e rupee is a person specific or purpose specific digital voucher whereas if you see e rupee it is a digital currency which the rbi is contemplating now coming back we will talk about its usage see e rupee will be issued in the same denomination as the paper currency and it will be distributed through the intermediaries that is banks transactions will be through a digital wallet which is offered by the participating banks the currencies can be stored on mobile phones and devices transactions can be both person to person p to p and person to merchant that is p to m for p to m transactions such as shopping there will be qr codes at the merchant location a user will be able to withdraw digital tokens from banks in the same way she can currently withdraw physical cash she will be able to keep her digital tokens in the wallet and spend them online or in person or transfer them via an app while upi based apps like google pay and paytm have a daily and per transaction spending limit the rpi has not fixed any limit on holding digital rupees in wallets digital rupee transactions above rupees 2 lakh are likely to be reported for tax matters so this is the main advantage now rbi has categorized e rupee into two types first one is the retail e rupee it is an electronic version of cash primarily meant for retail transactions it can potentially be used to buy almost everyone and can provide access to safe money for payment and settlements second one is the wholesale cbdc it is designed for restricted access to select financial institutions it has the potential to transform the settlement systems for financial transactions undertaken by banks in government securities it will make the capital market more efficient and secure in terms of operational cost use of collateral and liquidity management 
then also know that the structure of CBDC can be either token based or account based. A token based CBDC would be a bearer instrument like banknotes. Individual holding the tokens at a given time would be presumed to own them. This form is viewed as the preferred mode of CBDC as this would be very similar to physical cash. The receiver will have to verify if sender's ownership of token is genuine. Then if we see the account based CBDC, it will require maintenance of record of balances and transactions of all holders of the CBDC and indicate the ownership of the monetary balances. An intermediary will verify the identity of an account holder. This system is more suitable for CBDC W that is wholesale. Now read the question. Here the answer for this question is option D 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. Here all the statements are the main features of CBDC. Now we will move on to the next question. See this question reads the term Vayumitra sometimes mentioned in the news recently is option A a chatbot developed by IRCTC B the first banking robot in India C a humanoid robot introduced to assist teachers at schools in India D a humanoid built by ISRO before seeing the answer let's have a discussion then we'll get back see actually Vayumitra is a half humanoid while humanoid is basically a robot with the appearance of a human being we can say that Vayumitra is a half humanoid because she has only a head two hands and a torso and she does not have lower limbs so this is how she looks like like any robot a humanoid or half humanoids function are determined by the computer systems to which it is connected now talking about its purpose first we will understand the meaning of the word in the term Vayomitra, Vayoma means space and Mitra means friend. So, she was designed and developed to fly aboard unmanned test missions ahead of the Gaganyaan human space flight mission. See, as we all know, India is planning to send humans into space through the Gaganyaan mission. Now, you may be wondering why ISRO is using a robot to test their rockets and crew recovery systems. Well, this is because they don't want to risk a human life just it. So, Vayumitra is going to take one for the team and do all the dangerous stuff for us. She's going to be doing a lot of important tasks up there like pressing buttons, replacing carbon dioxide canisters and monitoring the crew module. She can receive comments from Earth, respond to voice comments and even report back on the health of the spacecraft. If there is anything wrong up there, she is going to be the first one to know. So just like the artificial intelligence and robotics powered computer system TARS, which you would have seen in the movie Interstellar, Vayumitra Humanoid will test the ground for the human spaceflight. She will also report back to the Earth on the changes occurring in the crew module during the space flight in Britain, such as heat radiation levels. All these functions performed by Vayumitra will help ISRO to understand the safety levels required in the crew module that will eventually fly a human being. So this is the significance of this particular humanoid. Recently, the ISRO inertial systems unit have successfully integrated the humanoid with a computer brain which enables it to read control panels aboard the unmanned test flight and it will be able to communicate with the ISRO ground station. This is why it was in news. Now read the question. The answer for this question is option D, a humanoid built by ISRO. Now this question reads, which of the following organizations is not part of the World Bank group? Option A, IBRT, option B, IDA, option C, GATT, option D, MIGA. To answer this question, you should know about World Bank and the World Bank Group. First, we will see about them and then we will solve the question. See, the World Bank is an international development organization owned by 180 countries. So, it is like a cooperative made of 189 member countries. Its role is to reduce poverty by lending 
money to the governments of its poorer members to improve their economy and to improve the standard of living of their people the bank is also one of the world's largest research centers in development it has specialized departments that use this knowledge to advise countries in areas like health education nutrition finance justice law and environment back in 1944 the world bank was born to rebuild europe and japan after world war 2 so it is like a superhero squad for countries in need and when it started it had only 38 members now most countries are part of this club but wait there's more the world bank group is like the avengers different heroes with different skills but all working towards a common goal we have got the ibrd which loans money to low and middle income countries then there's ida which helps out the low income countries then the ifc is like the private sector's bff it basically loans money to private companies then miga is all about encouraging private companies to invest in foreign countries and last but not the least we have got the icsid which helps investors and countries resolve their differences when they don't see eye to eye hope you are clear with the concept now read the question again the correct answer for this question is option c general agreement on trade and tariffs because this is related to wto now we will move on to the next question see art and culture carries a lot of weightage in upsc prelims every year we can expect a question in this area in art and culture the dance forms are very important look at these previous year questions asked about various dance forms so this year also we can expect a question about our dance form so this prompted me to frame this particular question the question reads how do you distinguish between dandiya and garba dances statement number 1 garba is performed before the ritual of aarti and dandiya is performed after the ritual statement number 2 garba is performed with a wooden stick but dandiya is performed with an earthen pot statement number 3 Garba has a more devotional appeal as it is performed to bhajans and chants but dandiya is more of a merriment dance select the correct answer using the code given below three statements are given and we have to find the correct statement now look at statement number 1 this statement is correct actually garba and dandiya they both originated in gujarat and they are performed during navratri and as stated here garba is performed before the ritual of aarti and dandiya is performed after the ritual moving on to statement 2 statement 2 is incorrect it is dandiya that is performed with the wooden stick and garba which is performed with the pot here the last statement is correct garba has a more devotional appeal this is because it is performed to bhajans and chants praising the main divine forms of goddess durga as we already saw it is done before the aarti is performed on the other hand dandiya is usually played during the late evening as part of the merriment after the aarti is done since statement 1 and 3 are correct the answer for this question is option a 1 and 3 only now we will take up the next question this question reads consider the following statements about delimitation commission statement number 1 under article 82 the parliament enacts a delimitation act after every election statement number 2 orders of the delimitation commission have the force of law and cannot be called in question before any court option number 3 the order of the delimitation commission comes into force on a date specified by the parliament which of the above mentioned statements are correct first we will learn about delimitation commission and then we will get back to the question first know that delimitation is the process of redrawing boundaries of lok sabha and state assembly to represent changes in the population it is mainly done to give equal representation to equal segments of the population under article 82 the parliament enacts a delimitation act after every census 
Once the act is in force, the union government sets up a delimitation commission and this commission is made up of a retired Supreme Court judge, the chief election commissioner and the respective state election commissioners. The commission is supposed to determine the number and boundaries of the constituencies. The commission is also tasked with identifying seats reserved for SC and ST population. All this is done on the basis of the latest census and in case of difference of opinion among the members of the commission, the opinion of the majority prevails. The orders of the delimitation commission have the force of law and it cannot be called in question before any court. The copies of its orders are laid before the House of People and the State Legislative Assembly concerned, but no modifications are permissible therein by them. Moving on to the history of Delimitation Commission, in the history of the Indian Republic, Delimitation Commission have been set up four times, 1952, 1963, 1973 and 2002 under the Acts of 1952, 1962 1972 and 2002. However, the 2002 Act did not make any changes in total Lok Sabha seats or their apportionment between various states. It also left out a few states including Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Nahaland and Manipur from the exercise due to security risks. And recently, in 2020, the central government has reconstituted the Delimitation Commission for these four states and the Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, see the question. Here, statement number one is incorrect. Under Article 82, the Parliament enacts a Delimitation Act not after every election, but after every census. Here, statement number two is correct. The orders of the Commission cannot be questioned before any court. Here statement number 3 is incorrect. The orders of the Delimitation Commission come into force on a date specified by the President and not the Parliament. So the correct answer for this question is option B, 2 only. Now we will take up the next question. This question reads, which of the following statements is incorrect about green crackers? So this question is about green crackers. It is very important that we know about these crackers because UPSA gives importance to environment related things. We all know that green crackers were produced as an alternative to the conventional crackers which was hazardous to environment. Last year also Delhi government has passed an order banning the storage, sale and use of all type of firecrackers in the national capital till January 1, 2023. This is exactly why we should be aware of information about green crackers. Now let us solve the question. See the first option says that green crackers contain barium nitrate which is the alternate for the hazardous material present in the conventional crackers. This is incorrect. See, green crackers are also called as eco-friendly crackers because they are less harmful than the conventional crackers. The constituents that make the conventional crackers harmful to the environment include barium nitrate, arsenic, aluminium etc. But instead of these, green crackers use elements like magnesium, potassium etc. So the correct answer here is option A. But then we will also see other options about green crackers to know more about it. See option 2 says green crackers come in three brands namely Swiss, Star, Safal. It is true. There are three types of green crackers namely Safas that is safe water releaser, star that is safe thermite cracker and safal that is safe minimal aluminium. All these will reduce the particulate matter released into the environment. They reduce the sound intensity which makes the third option right. See conventional crackers make sound around 160 decibels but in case of green crackers it is reduced to 100 to 120 decibels. This helps in reducing the noise pollution created by conventional crackers. Fourth option says that green crackers approval process is handled by petroleum and explosive safety organization. This is correct. See 
These crackers were first designed by NIRI that is National Environmental and Engineering Research Institute under CSIR. These crackers are produced by licensed manufacturers approved by CSIR. Most importantly, Petroleum and Explosive Safety Organization is tasked with certifying that the crackers are made without arsenic, mercury and barium and are not loud beyond a certain threshold. If you want to differentiate green crackers from conventional ones, then know that there will be a green logo printed on the box of green crackers. So that's all you need to know about green crackers. Now let's take up the next question. This question reads, Prosopsis julifera, which is recently seen in news, is an example of which of these? So the question asks about Prosopsis julifera. Before discussing this question, firstly let's talk about invasive species. So we can call them party crashers of the ecosystem. These guys are not native to the environment and they mess up the whole balance by their mere presence. They can either arrive on their own or someone might have brought them to the party uninvited. These invasives have some impressive traits that make them formidable enemies. They can reproduce faster, spread rapidly, adopt to any environmental condition and they are very tough. They can harm the environment, economy and even our health. Apart from this, invasive species can also change the soil structure and their allelo chemicals destroy the native species and diversity. They take over the ecosystem making it impossible to control them and expensive to get rid of them. A government keeps tabs on these species by maintaining a database of invasive alien species. So as per the Zoological Survey of India, we have got about 154 species of these faunal communities. This includes 56 land and freshwater species and 98 marine species. So know that water hyacinth, prosophis julifera are examples of invasive species. So the right answer for this question is option D, invasive species. Now we will move on to the next question. See, our next question is about Jal Jeevan mission. Three statements are given and you have to find the correct statement. Before we approach this question, let us first revise some points about Jal Jeevan mission. See, the mission comes under Jal Shakti ministry. The mission is envisioned to provide safe and adequate drinking water through individual household tap connections by 2024 to all households in rural India. Here note the point, the main focus is only on the rural area. Now coming to the works done under the mission, the works or schemes carried out under the mission include in-village water supply infrastructure for tap water connection to every household. Second, the scheme focuses on augmenting the drinking water resource. Thirdly, transfer of water. When quantity of water is an issue, water is transferred to areas where there is deficiency in water resources. Fourthly, technological intervention for treatment to make water portable. This is done where water quality is an issue but quantity is sufficient. Fifthly, the scheme focuses on retrofitting of completed and ongoing piped water supply schemes to provide FHTC. Fifthly, it concentrates on grey water management. Seventhly, capacity building of various stakeholders and support activities to facilitate the implementation. So these are some of the important points that you should know about the Jal Jeevan mission. Now let's take the question. Your statement number one is incorrect. As we saw just now, the scheme focuses only on the rural areas. The mission aims to provide safe and adequate drinking water through individual household tap connections by 2024 to all households in rural India. Your statement number two is correct. This also we saw now. Grey water management is an important component of this mission. Statement number three is incorrect. According to the recent Jaljeevan survey, 
the states and union territories that have achieved 100% functional household tap connection to every rural household are Goa, Haryana, Gujarat, Punjab, Telangana, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Dadar and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Dio and Puducherry. So the correct answer for this question is option B, 2 only. Now we will move on to the next question. Now look at this question here. It is about the straits that connect Sea of Azov with Black Sea. We all know Black Sea is close to Ukraine, right? That's exactly why I framed this question. Because of Russia-Ukraine war, we may expect a map question about Ukraine's location or about the water bodies nearby Ukraine. So to be prepared, let's solve this question. Look at the maps here. As you can see, the strait that connects Sea of Azov with Black Sea is Kerch Strait. Now we will see the other straits also. Look at this image. The strait that connects Black Sea with Sea of Marmara is Bosporus Strait. And the strait that connects the Sea of Marmara with Aegean Sea is Dardanelle Strait. These two straits are significant because they separate Asian Turkey from European Turkey. Finally, the Strait of Gibraltar connects Atlantic Ocean directly to the Mediterranean Sea. It is the one that separates Europe from Africa. The correct answer for this question is option B, Kurt Strait. Also, do not forget to revise about other important water bodies near Ukraine. With this, we will take up the next question. See, this question is about right to information. Here, the first statement tells that right to information is a part of fundamental right and comes under article 21 this particular statement is wrong supreme court in raj narain versus state of uttar pradesh case ruled that right to information is a part of fundamental right and comes under article 19 and not under article 21 right to information was enacted in 2005 for the citizens to exercise their right with wider scope. So information commissioners at central and state level are appointed to provide information. Here statement number 2 is correct because according to the provisions of the RTA Act, information to an applicant is to be supplied within 30 days from the receipt of application by the public authority and if the information is regarding a citizen's life or liberty, then the RTA application must be granted or refused within 48 hours. Here, third statement tells that information related to intellectual property rights is exempted from the purview of the RTA Act. Section 8.1 mentions exemptions against furnishing information under RTA Act. The citizens can only seek information from the government authorities that the government can disclose to the parliament. Some information that can affect the sovereignty and integrity of India is exempted from the purview of RTA. Information relating to internal security, relations with foreign countries, intellectual property rights and cabinet decisions are exempted from RTA. This question asks for the correct statement and the answer for this question is option C, 2 and 3 only. Now let's move on to the next question. This question here is about Saivism and its major six. First of all, let us see some facts about Saivism and then we will try to solve the question. Saivism is one of the major Hindu traditions that worship Lord Shiva. The roots of Saivism can be traced back to prehistoric India and know that there have been evidences of the worship of Lord Shiva in ancient archaeological sites such as in Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. In the Rig Veda, Lord Shiva is referred by the name Rudra. So there are three major sects in Saivism. They are Saiva Siddhanda, Kashmiri Saivism and Veera Saivism. Let's see them one by one. First is Saiva Siddhanda. This school of doctrine is based on the dualistic principle. It means they propagate the existence of both matter and spirit. Another example is that they believe the existence of God and world. See, this school is popular mainly in South India and derives its doctrine from the works of several Saiva saints and philosophers from the South. 
the most prominent among them was Nambi and our Nambi who composed Thirumarai. This is only considered as the foundational work of the school. Other prominent saints include Appar, Sundarar and Samandar. Then coming to Kashmiri Saivism, see it derives its name from the region of Kashmir where it gained prominence before the arrival of Islam in India. So according to this school, Shiva is the ultimate reality and there is nothing beyond and they propagate monoism meaning there is no real separation between God and the world. They are one reality. Now finally, Veera Saivism. See, Veera Saivism rose to prominence during the medieval period in Karnataka and the adjoining areas of Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Veera Saivism derives its name from the heroic nature of Shiva himself in his ferocious aspect as Veera Bhatra. The sect is also known as Lingayatta sect since its followers wear a Shivalinga around their necks or on their bodies. The sect was made popular by Basavana in Karnataka in the 12th century. Now look at the question. First statement says that the Kashmiri Saivism school is dualistic which is contrary to the monastic school of Shaiva Siddhanta. This statement is incorrect. We saw that Kashmiri Saivism propagate monoism. Here, statement number 2 and 3 are correct as we saw in the discussion. So, the correct answer for this question is option D, 2 and 3 only. Now, we will move on to the next question. See, this question is about the Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act of 1994. So, before solving this question, let us see some basic information about Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act of 1994. So this act was passed by parliament during 1994 and it came into force on February 1995. The main objective of this act is to regulate the removal, storage and transplantation of human organs and tissues for therapeutic purposes and for the prevention of commercial dealings in human organs. Now let's solve this practice question. See the first statement tells that Brain death is not an accepted form of death as per this act. This statement is incorrect. Section 2 of this act defines brain death as an accepted form of death. This section paves way for donating organs from brain dead persons. Also, the act defines the term near relative. It means spouse, son, daughter, father, mother, brother and sister. Grandparents and grandchildren were added to near relative list by the amendment made in 2011. According to section 3 of the act, every hospital which is doing a transplant activity that is either retrieval of organ or organ transplantation must have a transplant coordinator in the hospital. So moving on to the next statement, it tells that this act empowers central government to maintain a complete registry of all donors as well as recipients of different types of organs. So this statement is true. Section 13D of the act empowers the central government to maintain a complete registry of all donors as well as recipients of different types of organs. Take a note that the question asks for the incorrect statement. So the answer is option A, one only. Now we will move on to the next question. See, this question reads, consider the following statements with reference to African swine fever. So first we will see some information about African swine fever and then we will get back to the question. See, African swine flu is a highly contagious and fatal animal disease that infects and leads to an acute form of hemorrhagic fever in domestic and wild pigs. It is caused by a unique enveloped DNA virus placed in the family as far viridae. It is a large DNA virus that replicates in the cytoplasm and is the only member of the as far viridae family. Members of the pig family are susceptible to infection. See, the African swine flu was first detected in Africa in the 1920s. Historically, outbreaks have been reported in Africa and parts of Europe, South America and the Caribbean. However, 
Since 2007, the disease has been reported in multiple countries across Africa, Asia, and Europe in both domestic and wild pigs. Some of the other symptoms of the disease include high fever, depression, anorexia, loss of appetite, hemorrhages in the skin, vomiting, and diarrhea, among others. Know that the mortality is close to 95 percentage to 100 percentage, and since the fever has no cure, the only way to stop its spread is by culling the animal. Now, talking about its transmission, African swine flu only spreads from pig to pig, so us humans don't have to worry about catching it. However, it can be transmitted in a few different ways, like direct contact. with infected pigs or their bodily fluids or even via contaminated equipments or vehicles also it spreads through biological vectors like ticks of the species ornithodorus now don't confuse african swine flu with swine flu or swine influenza or hog flu or pig flu they are different from one another humans can be infected with avian swine and other zoonotic influenza viruses such as avian influenza virus subtypes and swine influenza virus subtypes human infections are primarily acquired through direct contact with infected animals or contaminated environments remember these viruses have not acquired the ability of sustained transmission among humans now if we see this question here all the statements given here are correct so the correct answer for the question is option d 1 2 3 and 4 only now we will move on to the next question so this question talks about dagong first we will see some important facts about dagong and then we will solve this question see dagong which is also called as sea cow is a marine mammal it belongs to the family dagongidae of the order sirenia Note that it is the state animal of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Dagong is the only existing herbivorous mammal species that lives exclusively in the sea. It mainly feeds on sea grass and other aquatic vegetation. It grows about three meter long and weighs about four hundred kilogram. Dagongs have an expanded head and trunk-like upper lip, and they share a common ancestry with other notable animal kingdom members like elephants now if we speak of their habitats dagongs are mostly distributed in shallow tropical waters in the indo-pacific region australia has the largest dagong populations and is found along the western coast of madagascar along the eastern coast of africa that is in the red sea and persian gulf then it is also found around the indian subcontinent and the western pacific particularly in india they are seen in gulf of manar gulf of kutch park bay and the andaman and nicobar islands here you have to note that it is not found along the entire coastline of india they mostly live in the oceans but sometimes they move up into the land especially in areas where there is brackish water So now if you see the question here statement number 1 is incorrect they are not confined to indian ocean then india's first dagong conservation reserve is coming up in tamil nadu actually for this reason only dagong was in news in october 2022 so statement 3 is incorrect now talking about the conservation in india dagong is protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act that is it bans the killing of dagong and also bans the purchasing of dagong meat then dagong is categorized as vulnerable in the iucn red list of endangered species then under the sites convention it is protected under appendix 1 so statement 2 is correct here the question asks for incorrect statements so the correct answer for the question is option d 1 and 3 only Also we have a previous year question regarding dagong in 2015 you can have a look at it with this note we'll take up the next question this question reads which of the following statements is incorrect about snow leopard 
first we will see about snow leopard and then we will get back to the question see snow leopard is often referred to as a mountain ghost because of its coat that helps it blend in a snowy rocky environment the tiger is called llama in the lisu dialect and is also called llamafu it is a felid in the genus panthera native to the mountain ranges of central and south asia felid means a mammal of the cat family so they prey on animals such as blue sheep ibex marmots pikas and hares if we talk about its habitat it inhabits alpine and subalpine zones at elevations of 3000 to 4500 meter ranging from eastern afghanistan the himalayas and the tibetan plateau to southern siberia mongolia and western china in the northern part of its range it also lives at lower elevations so they are not endemic to indian subcontinent snow leopards become sexually mature at 2 to 3 years and they normally live for 15 to 18 years in the wild in captivity they can live for up to 25 years they are largely threatened because of the loss of natural prey species retaliatory killing due to conflict with humans and also because of illegal trade of its fur and bones and now if we talk about the conservation efforts it comes under vulnerable category of the iucn red list see the snow leopards had been listed as endangered on the red list since 1986 later in 2017 it has been improved from endangered to vulnerable status again it is because of the conservation efforts then it is listed in sites appendix 1 also it is listed as threatened with extinction in schedule 1 of the convention on the conservation of migratory species of wild animals since 1985 then it is a flagship conservation species of india also it's part of 21 critically endangered species for the recovery program under the ministry of environment forest and climate change then india is a party to the global snow leopard and ecosystem protection program since 2013 also know that india has launched secure himalayas initiative which is funded by the global environmental facility and the united nation development program then we have the project snow leopard 2009 this program was to promote an inclusive and participatory approach to conserve snow leopards and their habitats so now if we see the question from the discussion we had we can arrive at the answer option c we saw during the discussion that snow leopard is not endemic to indian subcontinent so with this we will take up the next question see this question here gives us some details and based on that details we have to find out the correct dynasty kalinganagara was the capital city of this dynasty puri jagannath temple konark sun temple were built by the emperors of this dynasty which of the following dynasties best matches the above given description see the correct answer to this question is option b eastern ganga dynasty now we will see in brief about eastern ganga dynasty see eastern ganga dynasty is the one which ruled over the regions of present day odisha some portions of west bengal andhra pradesh and chatisgarh and they ruled this region from kalinga until the beginning of 15th century they are named as eastern ganga dynasty and this is to differentiate them from the western ganga dynasty see the western ganga dynasty ruled the ancient karnataka region the eastern ganga dynasty are also called as chodha gangas it is believed that the dynasty's early rule might have started in the 5th century itself the early rulers had dandapuram as their capital but later on it was moved to kalinganagara king anandavarman chodaganga is one of the renowned and prominent rulers of the dynasty he is only responsible for the firm establishment of the eastern ganga dynasty it is believed that eastern ganga dynasty rulers married chola and chalukyas to strengthen the dynasty even 
అనంతవర్మన్ చూదంగా వాజ్ ద సన్ ఆఫ్ ద కింగ్ రాజరాజ దేవ అండ్ ద చోలా ప్రిన్సెస్ రాజసుందరి అపార్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ దిస్ ద రూలర్స్ ఆఫ్ ద ఈస్టర్న్ గంగా డైనస్టీ వెర్ గ్రేట్ పేట్రన్స్ ఆఫ్ రిలీజియన్ అండ్ ఆర్ట్స్ ద టెంపుల్స్ ఆఫ్ ద గంగా పీరియడ్ వేర్ అమంగ్ ద మాస్టర్ పీసెస్ ఆఫ్ హిందూ ఆర్కిటెక్చర్ సో ప్రామినెంట్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ ఇస్ ద పూరి జహన్నాథ్ టెంపుల్ ఇట్ ఈస్ బిలీవ్డ్ దాట్ ద వర్క్స్ ఆఫ్ పూరి జహన్నాథ్ టెంపుల్ వర్ స్టార్టెడ్ డ్యూరింగ్ ద పీరియడ్ ఆఫ్ అనంతవర్మన్ చోద గంగా and another important temple is konark sun temple which was built by narasimha deva 1 he was one of the successors of anantavarman chota ganga that's all about eastern ganga dynasty now we will move on to the next question now look at this question here it is about the electoral bonds i have framed this question about electoral bonds because in october month supreme court asked the government about the transparent nature of electoral bonds so this year upsc might ask a question about electoral bonds so now we will try to solve this question see here the first statement says electoral bond is an interest free banking instrument see this is correct electoral bonds are instruments through which one can donate money to political parties it was introduced in the year 2018 to bring transparency in the electoral funding process see this bond is a bearer instrument in the nature of a promissory note and an interest free banking instrument second statement says that electoral bonds can be used to make donation for any political party in the country this is incorrect see a citizen of india or a body incorporated in india will be eligible to purchase the bond this is the eligibility criteria for the donor also know that donations can be done only to political parties registered under section 29a of the representation of people act 1951 and the party should have secured not less than 1% of the votes polled in the last general election to the house of people or a legislative assembly so this is the eligibility criteria for the political party now statement number 3 says that electoral bonds have a life of only 15 days this is correct see the bonds have a life of only 15 days during which it can be used for making donation to the political parties apart from this know that electoral bonds are issued in the denominations of rupees 1000 rupees 10000 rupees 1 lakh rupees 10 lakh and rupees 1 crore these bonds can be bought from authorized branches of the state bank of india and the donor is required to pay the amount through a check or a digital mechanism to the authorized sbi branch note that cash is not allowed finally fourth statement says that electoral bonds bear the name of the donor to ensure transparency in the system of political funding this statement is incorrect to maintain anonymity in the funding process the bond will not contain the name of the donor thus the political party will not be aware of the donor's identity so here we found that statement 1 and 3 are correct and statement 2 and 4 are incorrect so the correct answer for this question is option b 1 and 3 only now we will move on to the next question see this question is about mohan shan declaration the correct answer for this question is option a promoting geospatial technologies to achieve the UN's sustainable development goals this declaration was made during the first UN World Geospatial Information Congress which was held in 2018 before seeing more about the UN World Geospatial Information Congress let us take a look at the other options given here see option B that is international declaration of women's right set up at the fourth world conference on women is related to the beijing declaration 1995 option c collaborative program for the eradication of neglected tropical disease is related to the london declaration of 2012 option d lesbian gay bisexual and transgender human rights is related to 2006 
Declaration of Montreal. Now coming back to the UN World Geospatial Information Congress, I specifically framed this question because of the second UN World Geospatial Information Congress which was held in Hyderabad, India in 2022. This year we can expect a question in this area. So we will see some important points about UN World Geospatial Information Congress. This Congress was organized by the UNGGIM that is United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management. Here note that this body aims to address global challenges regarding the use of geospatial information and to serve as a body for global policy making in the field of geospatial information management. The first Congress was held in 2018 in Peking, China. The Mohanshan Declaration was adopted here. The Congress is held every four years. So, in 2022, the second Congress was held in Hyderabad. The main objective of the Congress is enhancing international collaboration in geospatial information management among member states. Theme of the Congress is geo enabling the global village no one should be left behind now let us see the focus areas of the congress first is the use of geospatial information to collect manage report and act on indicators of the sdg second is using geospatial information to address climate change the third is the use of geospatial information to support sustainable development. The last one is aligning the existing national capabilities to the nine strategic pathways of the United Nations Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. So these are some important points about the UN World Geospatial Information Congress. With these points in mind, now we will move on to the next question. Look at this question here. It is about the Global Hunger Index. I have framed this question because Global Hunger Index ranking for 2022 came in the month of October. And India ranked 107 out of 121 countries on the Global Hunger Index. We all know that UPSC has asked many times questions about index. In 2016, Ease of Doing Business Index was asked. In 2017, Global Gender Gap Index was asked. In 2018, Rule of Law Index was asked. So this year, we have to be prepared for questions related to indices. So first, we will see some important facts about Global Hunger Index. See, Global Hunger Index is a tool designed to comprehensively measure and track hunger at global, regional and national levels. It reflects multiple dimensions of hunger over time. See, each country's global hunger index score is calculated based on a formula and this formula combines four indicators. These four indicators together capture the multidimensional nature of hunger. The indicators are undernourishment. It is the share of the population with insufficient caloric intake. Then second is the child stunning. It is the share of children under age 5 who have low height for their age. It reflects chronic undernutrition. Third is the child wasting. So it is the share of children under age 5 who have low weight for their height. This reflects acute undernutrition. Then fourth is the child mortality. It is the share of children who die before their fifth body. This partly reflects the fatal mix of inadequate nutrition and unhealthy environments. And the weightage of indicators and composition of GHI scores is given in this image here. See, based on the scores, the severity level is divided into low, moderate, serious, alarming, extremely alarming. If the GHI score of a country is below 9.9, .9, then the severity of hunger situation is low in that country. 
but if it is greater than 50 then it means that the hunger situation is extremely alarming in that country so with this information now we will take up the question know that global hunger index is jointly published by concern worldwide and wealth hunger health so the answer for this question is option c now we will move on to the next question look at this question here this question is about k15 slbm before approaching the question let us learn some points about the k15 slbm k15 slbm that is k15 submarine launched ballistic missile is india's nuclear capable submarine launched ballistic missile it has a range of approximately 750 km. The K-15 SLBM is also called by the name Sagarika and it is codenamed as B-05. Know that K-15 SLBM belongs to the K missile family. They are indigenously developed by the DRDO and they are named after Dr. Abdul Kalam. The K family missiles are primarily submarine launched ballistic missiles. This means that the K family missiles can be launched from the submarine. Currently, INS Arihant, which is India's first nuclear powered submarine, can launch K 15 SLBM. See, K 15 SLBM was designed for retaliatory nuclear strikes. For example, if our enemy country launches nuclear attack on us, now we will be able to launch retaliatory nuclear strikes on our enemy from INS Arihant with the help of K-15 SLBM. So K-15 SLBM can carry nuclear warheads. The development of these naval platform launched missiles began in the late 1990s. And it was started as a step towards completing India's nuclear triad, which is nothing but the capability of launching nuclear missiles from land, sea and air based assets. Because K-15 missiles are to be launched from submarines, they are lighter, smaller and stealthier than their land based counterparts. Example, its land based counterpart is the Agni series of missiles. Agni missiles are medium and intercontinental range nuclear capable ballistic missiles. See under the SLBM family missiles of various ranges have been developed. K-15 Sagarika is one such missile. Apart from this India has also developed and tested the K-4 missiles from the same family which have a range of 3500 km. It is said that more members of the K family with high ranges are also on cards. And finally note that after US, Russia, UK, France and China, India is the sixth country in the world to have nuclear powered submarines armed with ballistic missiles. With this information, let us approach the question now. Here, statement number 1 is correct. K-15 SLBM was indigenously developed by DRDO. Statement number 2 is incorrect. As of now, K-15 SLBM can be launched from INS Arihant and the, and the Kalwari class cannot launch K-15 SLBM. Your third statement is also incorrect. K-15 SLBM has a range of approximately 750 kilometers and not 1500 kilometers. The question asks for incorrect statement. So the correct answer to this question is option B, 2 and 3 only. With this, we will take up the next question. See, this question is about stem cells. Consider the following statements regarding stem cells. Statement number 1, stem cells are unspecialized cells. Statement 2, stem cells exist in embryo only. Statement 3, stem cells can be used in the treatment of cardiovascular diseases. We are looking at this question because UPSC has asked about stem cell technology in prelims 2012 and it is one of the important topics in the science and tech area. With this understanding, now we will solve this question. First, we will take this statement. It tells that stem cells are unspecialized cells. This statement is correct. 
basically there are two types of cells present in the body called as specialized cells and unspecialized cells specialized cells have specific capabilities that allow them to perform certain tasks for example a red blood cell contains hemoglobin that allows it to carry oxygen stem cells have unspecialized capability that is they can differentiate into any cell of an organism and have the ability of self renewal here self renewal means the ability to divide and make an indefinite number of copies of themselves so stem cells can be used to produce any other cell type in our body at times of need the second statement tells that stem cells exist in embryo only this statement is incorrect because the stem cells exist in both embryo and adult cells in case of embryo stem cells are found in umbilical cord and in case of adult stem cells are found in bone marrow the third statement tells that stem cells can be used in treatment of cardiovascular diseases this statement is true cardiovascular illnesses can deprive the heart tissue of oxygen causing the formation of scar tissue this alters the blood pressure or blood flow according to research stem cells from adult bone marrow can differentiate into those required to repair the blood vessels and heart due to the secretion of numerous growth factors from this discussion we can answer this question see the question asks for the correct statement and the answer is option b 1 and 3 only now we will move on to the next question look at this question here this question is about monkey pox disease before answering the question let us see some points about monkey pox disease see monkey pox disease is an infectious disease caused by the monkey pox virus the monkey pox virus belongs to the genus orthopox virus of the pox viridae family know that monkey pox is a zoonotic disease this means that monkey pox can spread from animals to humans it can also spread from humans to other humans and from the environment to humans now talking about the symptoms the disease carries symptoms that are similar to smallpox the symptoms of monkey pox include fever headache muscle pain along with rashes and blisters on the face palm feet mouth or eyes see in most cases monkey pox is a self limited disease where the symptoms resolve spontaneously without any specific treatment however newborns young children and people with fundamental immune deficiencies may be more likely to develop severe symptoms now if we see the transmission of the virus the virus can be transmitted from both animals to human and between the humans here animal to human transmission is due to close contact with blood fluids or skin lesions of infected animals then human to human transmission could happen through close contact with the individuals infected with monkey pox it can also spread through large respiratory droplets from coughing and sneezing or through body secretions skin lesions or contaminated articles of infected individuals now talking about the prevention and treatment options see there are no specific treatments available for monkey pox however due to the genetic similarities of smallpox and monkey pox viruses vaccines and antiviral agents used for the worldwide eradication of smallpox can also work against monkey pox the who report says that vaccination against smallpox is approximately 85 percentage effective in preventing monkey pox so the prior immunization against smallpox may lead to mild monkey pox infection now coming to the question here statement number 1 is correct monkey pox is a zoonotic disease then statement number 2 is also correct the vaccines used for the prevention of smallpox can also protect against monkey pox then statement number 3 is incorrect monkey pox virus can also spread through large respiratory droplets from coughing and sneezing of infected individuals 
So the correct answer here is option C, 1 and 2 only. Now we will move on to the next question. Look at this question. Four statements are given and we have to identify the animal that is best described by the statement. The correct option here is slender loris. It is a small nocturnal primate that is mainly found in southern India and Sri Lanka. The most striking feature of this arboreal animal is the pair of two large closely set brown eyes. Slender Norris has the habit of using the urine to wash its face and limbs which is thought to soothe or defend against the stink of toxic insects it prefers to eat. Then recently the Tamil Nadu government has notified a sanctuary in Kadavur specifically for slender loris. Apart from this, there are some other important points which we will see now. This animal mainly feeds on insects, leaves, flowers, slugs and sometimes eggs of birds. It has two different species associated with it. They are grey slender loris and red slender loris. Let me give you the geographical extent of these two species. Grey slender loris is found in both South India and Sri Lanka while red slender loris is found in Sri Lanka only. We saw that Tamil Nadu government has notified a sanctuary for slender loris, right? This sanctuary is for grey slender loris. Now look at its conservation status. IUCN has listed them as endangered. It is placed in Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of India. Then slender loris is placed in Appendix 2 of Sites Convention. So these are some important points about slender loris. With these points in mind, now we will move on to the next question. Look at this question. This question is about PSLV and GSLV. See, this type of science and tech topic is very favorite for UPSC. Now look at this previous year question here. A similar question about India's satellite launch vehicles was asked in 2019 UPSC prelims. So the question we are going to discuss is very important for your exam. Now before answering the question, let us understand the basic differences between PSLV and GSLV. First, let us see about generation. See, PSLV is the third generation satellite launch vehicle of India, whereas GSLV is the fourth generation satellite launch vehicle of India. Note that the first and second generation vehicles are SLV and ASLV respectively. Now we will see about the satellite delivery and the delivery orbits. PSLV is designed to deliver the earth observation or remote sensing satellites to sun synchronous circular polar orbits of 600 km altitude. Know that PSLV has earned the title the workhorse of ISRO because of its consistent delivery of various satellites to low earth orbits. If we take GSLV, GSLV is designed mainly to deliver the communication satellites to the highly elliptical geosynchronous transfer orbits. Now talking about the stages and engines, the PSLV is a four stage launch vehicle with first and third stage using solid rocket motor and second and fourth stage using liquid rocket engines. The PSLV also uses six trap-on motors which are mounted on the sides to augment the thrust provided by the first stage. Know that depending upon the number of strap-on boosters, the PSLV is classified into various versions like Corellon version, PSLV G, PSLV XL etc. Now coming to GSLV, the GSLV has only three stages. The first stage is using a solid rocket motor. Then the second stage is using a liquid rocket engine. And the third stage is using indigenously built cryogenic engine. Okay, so the cryogenic engine carries liquid hydrogen as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. GSLV also uses solid and liquid strap-on motors for the thrust. There are different variants of GSLV based on the lift off capacity. They are GSLV Mark 1, GSLV Mark 2 and GSLV Mark 3. 
With this information, now let's approach the question. Read the question. The first statement here is incorrect. We saw that PSLV is a four-staged launch vehicle and GSLV is a three-staged launch vehicle. Here statement number two is also incorrect. PSLV does not use cryogenic engines and it uses only solid motors and liquid engines. GSLV uses a cryogenic engine for its third stage. Here statement number three is correct. The question asks for incorrect statement. So the correct answer for this question is option A, one and two only. Now we will move on to the next question. Look at this question. Four statements about Sukanya Samriti Yojana are given and we have to select the correct statement. Here statement number one is correct. Sukanya Samriti Yojana was launched by our Prime Minister as a part of Beti Bachao Beti Batao campaign. It was launched on 22nd January 2015 in Panipat, Haryana. Statement two is also correct. This small saving scheme was launched targeting the parents of girl children. The main objective of the scheme is to help meet the education and marriage expenses of the girl child. Your statement number three is actually incorrect. As per the scheme, there can be only one account per girl child under the Sukanya Samriti Yojana. The account can be opened for a maximum of two girl children per family. But in the case of twins or triplets, then a maximum of three SSY accounts is allowed. Statement number four is also incorrect. As of December 2022, Uttar Pradesh is the state with the highest number of accounts under SSY. UP is followed by Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka. So the correct answer is option A, one and two only. As a part of this discussion, we will also see some important points about this scheme. Under this scheme, an account can be opened in post office or branches of authorized banks in the name of a girl child by submitting the birth certificate till she attains the age of 10. Note only, one account can be opened in the name of the girl child and the account can be transferred anywhere in India from one post office or bank to another. The account can be opened with a minimum of rupees 250. Note a minimum of rupees 250 and a maximum of rupees 150,000 can be deposited in a financial year. The interest for the amount will be calculated on a yearly compounded basis and will be credited to the account. One premature withdrawal of up to 50 percentage will be allowed on attaining the age of 18 for meeting the educational expenses. The account will mature on the completion of 21 years from the date of opening of the account or on the marriage of the account holder, whichever is earlier. So these are some points about Sukanya Samriti Yojana. With these points in mind, now we will move on to the next question. See, this question reads, which of the following best describes the term medium altitude long endurance that is male. See, this medium altitude long endurance is basically an UAV that is unmanned aerial vehicle which can fly up to medium altitude with long endurance that is an extended period of time. As you all know, UAV has the capability to fly autonomously or through remote control allowing for pre-programmed flight plans and operational use in daylight or in darkness. Whenever UPSC asks such question, see if you can arrive at the answer by looking for key terms. It will help you in saving some time. So the question just asks for the general definition. See, India's indigenous medium altitude long endurance unmanned aerial vehicle development program that is Rustam 2 achieved an important milestone by reaching an altitude of 25,000 feet and an endurance of 10 hours. That is why this was in news in October 2022. See, DRDO is expected to complete all user trials by August 2023. 
parallelly a separate project for the weaponization of the Rustam UAV is also underway. Remember, it has been designed and developed by the Aeronautical Development Establishment Bengaluru with production partners being Hindustan Aeronautics Limited and Bharat Electronics Limited. It is also known as Tapas BH, that is Tactical Airborne Platform for Aerial Surveillance Beyond Horizon 201. Currently, Tapas BH has an operating altitude of 30,000 feet endurance of 24 hours with electro-optical and synthetic aperture radars and a range of 250 kilometers. It can carry a variety of payloads of up to 350 kgs maximum. Some of its features are it is being developed to carry out surveillance and reconnaissance rules and is capable of carrying different combinations of advanced payload and capable of auto landing among others. It is being designed to acquire real-time high quality pictures and signal intelligence from fields of concern at medium to long ranges. Then it technologically matches contemporary unmanned aerial vehicles and will also be cheaper than the imported ones. The correct answer for this question is option D an unmanned aerial vehicle that flies at an altitude window of 10,000 to 30,000 feet for extended durations of time, typically 24 to 48 hours. Now we will take up the next question. See this question talks about United Nations Security Council. First we will see some basic facts about UNSC, then we will get back to the question. See, the Security Council was established by the UN Charter in 1945. It is one of the six principal organs of the United Nations. The other five organs of the United Nations are the General Assembly, the Trusteeship Council, the Economic and Social Council, the International Court of Justice and the Secretariat. Its primary responsibility is to work to maintain international peace and security. Some of the other functions of UNSC are listed here. You can go through it. The council is headquartered at New York. So talking about its members, see the council has 15 members, the 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent members who are elected for 2 years term. The 5 permanent members are United States, the Russian Federation, France, China and the United Kingdom. Each year, the General Assembly elects 5 non-permanent members for a 2-year term. The 10 non-permanent seats are distributed on a regional basis. The Council's Presidency is a capacity that rotates every month among its 15 members. Talking about the voting powers, each member of the Security Council has one vote. Decisions of the Security Council on matters are made by an affirmative vote of 9 members, including the concurring votes of the permanent members. A no vote from one of the five permanent members blocks the passage of the resolution. That is, even if one member says no, then the resolution cannot be passed. Any member of the United Nations which is not a member of the Security Council may participate without vote in the discussion of any question brought before the Security Council whenever the later considers that the interests of that member are specifically affected. So, this means that any member of the United Nations can participate in a discussion if the Security Council feels that the interest of that particular member is involved in the issue. Now see the question. The first statement says, only on the recommendation of United Nations Security Council, the General Assembly can decide to admit a state to the United Nations. Second statement states that it is the only organ of the United Nations that has the power to make decisions that member states are obligated to implement. Here, both the statements are correct. So, the correct answer for this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now we will see the next question. See, this question talks about vulture species. Now before answering the question, 
let us see some basic information about vultures see vultures are scavenging birds of prey they have been divided into new world vultures and old world vultures the new world vultures include the californian condors and the andean condors and the old world vultures include the white trumped and the red headed vultures new world vultures are found in north and south america old world vultures are found in europe africa and asia but according to sources there are no vultures in australia and antarctica now with respect to india if you see nine species of vultures exist in india you can see them in the image given here along with their iucn status among them five belong to the genus gibbs in these five species the three gibbs vulture namely the white rumped vulture long billed vulture and slender billed vulture are residents of india the remaining two the eurasian griffon vulture and the himalayan griffon vulture are largely wintering species they play a vital role in the ecosystem by cleaning up the rotten carcasses left in the open they scavenge on carcasses of animals and thereby help to keep the environment clean in addition to this they also scavenge on human carcasses so their removal will result in an increase in putrefying or decaying carcasses now we'll see some of the threats faced by them firstly the poisoning from diclofenac see this diclofenac is used as a veterinary non steroidal anti inflammatory drug for livestock this drug treats pain and inflammatory diseases such as gout in carcasses that vultures would feed on and this affects the vulture and leads to its death see you won't believe this just 0.4 to 0.7 percentage of animal carcasses contaminated with diclofenac is sufficient to decimate 99 percentage of vulture populations so the ministry of environment forest and climate change released the action plan for vulture conservation in the year 2006 and this included the ban of veterinary use of diclofenac by the drug controller general of india then the loss of natural habitats due to anthropogenic activities electrocution by power lines are some of the other threats faced by vultures remember india has taken two major steps to conserve the vulture population one is the action plan for vulture conservation 2020 to 25 it was launched by the ministry of environment forest and climate change next is the save program so now if we see the question The correct answer for this question is option A one only. We already have a previous year question in 2012 with respect to vultures. You can have a look at it. Now we will move on to the next question discussion. Look at this question here. This question is about Agni Prime missiles. So before answering the question, let us learn some points about Agni missiles and Agni P missile. First, let us take Agni missiles. See, Agni missiles are medium to long range surface to surface ballistic missiles. They were developed by the Defense Research Development Organization. Currently, there are 6 missiles in the Agni series. They are Agni 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and Agni P. Among these missiles, Agni 5 has a maximum range of up to 5000 kilometers. Know that all these missiles are able to deliver nuclear warheads. Now let us see a few facts about Agni Prime. The Agni Prime or Agni P is a two-stage surface-to-surface ballistic missile developed by the DRDO. It is a medium-range ballistic missile with a dual redundant navigation and guidance system. Here the term dual redundant means that there are two operating systems in the missile so if the primary system fails the second backup system will run the missile know that the missile uses solid propellant to run the engine and it has a range capability between 1000 to 2000 km the agni prime is also called a canisterized missile this means that the agni prime missile can be launched with the help of a canister here the canister is nothing but 
द सिलेंड्रिकल कंटेनर विच होल्ड्स द मिसाइल एंड एक्स एज अ लॉन्चिंग ट्यूब ऑफ द मिसाइल ऑल्सो नो दैट अग्नि पी इज अ न्यूक्लियर केपेबल मिसाइल दिस मीन्स दैट अग्नि पी इज केपेबल ऑफ डिलीवरिंग अ न्यूक्लियर वॉर हेड विद दिस इंफॉर्मेशन लेट एस अप्रोच द क्वेश्चन रीड द क्वेश्चन विद रेफरेंस टू अग्नि प्राइम मिसाइल कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स इट इज अ टू स्टेज मीडियम रेंज बैलिस्टिक मिसाइल दैट कैन बी लॉन्च विद द हेल्प ऑफ कैनेस्टर दिस स्टेटमेंट इज ट्रू वी सॉ दिस इन द डिस्कशन देन स्टेटमेंट टू डुअल रिडेंडेंट नेविगेशन एंड गाइडेंस सिस्टम इज वन ऑफ द फीचर्स ऑफ अग्नि प्राइम स्टेटमेंट थ्री इट इज केपेबल ऑफ डिलीवरिंग अ न्यूक्लियर वॉर हेड सो ऑल द स्टेटमेंट्स गिवन हियर आर करेक्ट सो द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन इज ऑप्शन डी वन टू एंड थ्री now we will take up the next question see this question is about air quality index we are seeing this particular question because upsc has asked a question from the same topic in 2016 prelims before solving our prelims question let us discuss some basic information about air quality index see air quality index is an eight parameter based air quality monitoring system which was launched by the Central Pollution Control Bureau in the year 2014 Basically there are 6 AQI categories they are good satisfactory moderately polluted poor very poor and severe AQI and its respective color code and health impacts are given below Pause this video and just go through it Note that AQI transforms complex air quality data of various pollutants into a single number and color for the public to easily understand about the air standard in their locality now the eight pollutants which are considered for the calculation of aqi are pm10 pm2.5 here pm stands for particulate matter then nitrogen dioxide sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide ozone ammonia and lead with this knowledge we can solve our prelims practice question we have seen that ozone ammonia and lead are considered for the calculation of aqi whereas carbon dioxide and mercury are not considered hence the answer for this question is option c 4 and 5 only now let's take up the next question for discussion see this question is about the bronze statues of chola period Before solving this question let us look about the lost wax technique which is used to craft the bronze statues of the chola period this technique involves the combination of bees wax a kind of camphor and a little oil firstly the bees wax and oil are mixed using hands once mixed the mixture is then used to do precisely sculpt the specific figure and all its intricate features the particular wax model is subsequently coated with clay and then dried and placed in an oven where the wax melts then the next step is melting panchalogam which is a metal alloy of bronze once melted it is poured into the clay mold which is now empty of the wax then the melted bronze completely fills the mold and is left to settle harden and then to cool once the process is complete the clay mold is then broken off leaving only the bronze sculpture now let's take up the question first statement tells that the bronze statues of the chola period are mostly devoid of ornamentation this statement is correct because it is one of the main features of chola bronze statue its other important features are these statues have poses and expressions on the face of the figures which are so detailed now see the second statement it tells that no bronze sculpture from the chola period can be exactly replicated this statement is also correct after casting the statue using lost wax technique the finer details are carved the statue is cleaned and then the markings or blemishes from the sculpture are removed finally the bronze sculpture is then smoothened and then polished this elaborate process makes every statue unique and very difficult to replicate please note that the question asks for the incorrect statement and both of the given statements are correct hence the correct answer is option d neither one nor two now we will move on to the next question 
look at this question here it is about coffee cultivation in india see upsc has not it asked directly any questions about coffee so this year we may expect a question on it and that's why i framed this question now let's solve it see here statement 1 says that in india coffee is grown predominantly in the slopes of northeastern states this statement is incorrect because in india coffee is grown predominantly in the slopes of the southern states in fact coffee growing areas can be grouped into three distinct categories first one is the traditional areas which includes karnataka kerala and tamil nadu it is believed that indian coffee sector began with planting of seven seeds of mocha during 1600 ad by the legendary holy saint baba buddhan in karnataka second one is the non traditional area which includes areas comprising andhra pradesh and odisha in the eastern ghats region third one only is the northeastern states so when compared to traditional areas non traditional areas and northeast areas recently only started coffee cultivation second statement says that assam is the largest coffee producing state in india this statement is also incorrect just now we saw that coffee cultivation is predominant in the southern states and the largest coffee producing state in india is karnataka assam is the largest tea producing state in the country the top 5 coffee producing states are karnataka kerala tamil nadu andhra pradesh and odisha also know that brazil is the largest coffee producer in the world third statement says that coffee board of india is a statutory organization which is tasked with the promotion and welfare measures of the coffee sector this is correct like tea board there is also a board for coffee sector coffee board is a statutory organization constituted under section 4 of the coffee act 1942 it functions under the administrative control of the ministry of commerce and industry the board comprises 33 members including the chairperson the remaining 32 members representing various interests are appointed as per provisions under rule 3 of the coffee rules 1955 The board is mainly focused in the areas of research, extension, development, market intelligence, external and internal promotion and welfare measures. If you want to know more about coffee cultivation in India, then watch our 22nd October 2023 analysis. Now the correct answer for this question is option C, 3 only. Now we will take up the next question. Look at this question here. It is about the solar and lunar eclipses. I have framed this question because in the month of October solar eclipse happened. So there is a chance that UPSC might ask question about eclipses. Now let's solve this question. First statement says that solar eclipse happens when sun comes in between the earth and the moon. This is actually incorrect. During a solar eclipse the moon only comes in between earth and sun. Solar eclipse occurs when part or all of the sun is blocked out by the moon as viewed from the earth so while seeing from earth there will be shadow on the sun that shadow will be cast by the moon this is about the solar eclipse arrangement and this image is the resultant of moon blocking the sun see there are many types of solar eclipses when the entire sun is blocked by the moon it is called as total solar eclipse when only part of the sun is blocked by the moon it is called partial solar eclipse when the moon is at its farthest point in its elliptical path of orbit it will be only capable of blocking a part of the sun this will leave the periphery of the sun still visible this type is called annular solar eclipse now the second statement says that lunar eclipse happens when moon comes in between sun and the earth see this statement is also incorrect during lunar eclipse the earth comes in between sun and the moon here the light from the sun will be blocked by the earth so the shadow of the earth will be cast on the moon like solar eclipses lunar eclipses are also of three types total lunar eclipse which occurs when the entire moon is in the earth's darkest shadow that is umbrella shadow 
partial lunar eclipse occurs when the sun earth and moon aren't exactly aligned so only part of the moon passes into earth's umbral shadow penumbral lunar eclipse occurs when the sun earth and the moon are not fully aligned here the moon passes through only the penumbra shadow of the earth and does not pass through the darkest part of the earth's shadow that is umbra so these are the three types of lunar eclipses now coming to the question we saw that both the statements are incorrect so the correct answer is option d neither one nor two now we will move on to the next question look at this question this question is about the ek bharat shreshta bharat program here four options are given and we have to find which one of these options is incorrect now before answering the question let us learn some points about ek bharat shreshta bharat program see this program was launched on 31st october 2015 on the occasion of the 140th birth anniversary of sardar vallabhbhai patel so this program was announced to commemorate patel's effort for making sure that india remained as a single nation during the difficult times of post independence period so through this initiative the knowledge of the culture traditions and practices of different states and union territories will be shared between them through the common platform so this will lead to an enhanced understanding and bonding between the states and the union territories thereby strengthening the unity and integrity of india note that all states and union territories are covered under this program as part of this ek bharat shreshta bharat program the states or union territories are paired at national level and these pairing will be in effect for one year or till the next round of pairing the state or union territory level pairings would be utilized for state level activities apart from this pairing there is also district level pairings and it would be independent of the state level pairings see the activities carried out under ek bharat shreshta bharat program will be very useful to link various states and districts in annual programs this in turn will connect people through exchanges in areas of culture tourism language education etc in addition to this the citizens will be able to experience the cultural diversity of a much larger number of state or union territory while realizing that india is one know that ministry of education has been designated as the nodal ministry for coordination of the ek bharat shreshta bharat program now let's approach the question read the question here option a that is it was launched on 31st october 2015 to commemorate sardar vallabhbhai patel's contribution to india's unity we know this statement is correct then look at option b this is incorrect it is implemented by the ministry of education so now we can arrive at the answer the answer is option b but we have to verify whether the other options are correct or not see option c it aims to connect people across the states through exchanges in the areas of culture tourism language and education this statement is correct look at option d all the states and union territories of india are covered under this program this statement is also correct so the correct answer is option b now we will move on to the next question our next question is about the office of governor three statements are given and we have to find which among them are the situational discretionary powers of the governor now we will have a discussion in this topic and then we'll get back to the question first let's see about the discretionary powers of governor article 163 provides constitutional discretionary powers to the governor article 163 says that governor should act in accordance with the advice of chief minister and his council of ministers except in certain cases where he can use his discretion pay attention here the constitution provides discretionary powers only to the governor and not to the president constitutional discretionary powers of governors are firstly the governor has the discretionary power to reserve a bill passed by the legislature of a state for the consideration of the president this is provided in article 200 secondly the governor acts in his discretion 
in the case for the recommendation of the president's rule in the state under article 356 thirdly the governor can exercise discretion by asking for specific information regarding administrative and legislative matters of the state these are some of the cases of discretionary powers of the governor provided by the indian constitution here note that there is another form of discretionary power which is also used by the governor which is called the situational discretionary power let's see what are they first is the appointment of the chief minister this is in case of hung assembly hung assembly means an assembly where there is no clear majority second is the dismissal of the council of minister when they cannot prove majority in the assembly so these are some of the cases of situational discretionary powers to the office of governor now we will see the question here statement one and three are situational discretionary powers of the governor and statement two is the constitutional discretionary power of the governor so the correct answer here is option c one and three only now we will move on to the next question look at this question here here some set of statements about a particular rice is given and we have to find which is the rice variety that is being described here so the question reads it is a black colored rice grown widely in north india's terai belt the rice is also known by the name buddha rice as it is associated with buddha's life the rice is well known for its medicinal and curative properties as it is rich in antioxidants which among the following is such a rice here there are four options the correct answer is option b kala namak rice now let us see some important points about kala namak rice see the term kala namak literally means black salt the kala namak rice got its name because of the black colored husk and black colored rice kala namak is one of the finest quality rice that has a strong fragrance this scented rice variety has been cultivated since 600 bc that is probably before the buddhist era the kala namak rice is also known as buddha rice because it is believed that buddha broke his fast on the day of enlightenment when kheer made from kala namak rice was offered to him kala namak is grown widely in up's terai belt know that terai or terai is the low land region in north india and southern nepal this region lies south of the outer foothills of the himalayas the shivalik hills and the north of the indo gangetic plain this low land terai belt is characterized by tall grasslands salt forests and clay rich swamps and this is where the kala namak rice grows now talking about the benefits of kala namak rice the kala namak rice is known for its medicinal and curative properties it is rich in antioxidants and has a high anthocyanin content this helps in the prevention of heart disease and improves the health of the skin apart from this the kala namak rice is also rich in iron and zinc which helps in regulating blood related problems recent research has shown that kala namak rice is excellent for diabetic patients so because of these valuable properties the export potential of kala namak rice is huge due to its long standing association with buddha kala namak rice is regarded as holy rice so they are now exported to the buddhist countries namely japan thailand myanmar sri lanka and bhutan that's all with this information now we will move on to the next question this question is about msp or minimum support price three statements are given and we have to find the correct statement before we answer this question let us first revise about msp minimum support price is the minimum price set by the government for certain agricultural products at which the products would directly be bought from the farmers if the open market prices are less than the cost incurred so from this we can infer that msp is a form of government intervention now why does the government provide msp 
see the prices of agricultural commodities often vary due to various factors in a country if a crop has seen a good harvest during a particular year it may see a sharp fall in its prices fall in prices means lesser profit for farmers so farmers may not sow the crop in the next year which will affect the supply to counter this msp is fixed by the government which is supposed to encourage higher investments and production of crops it also protects farmers from steep decline in prices now who and how is this price decided now who decides the price and how it is decided see the msp is fixed on the recommendation of commission for agricultural cost and prices that is cacp it considers various factors to determine the prices before making its recommendation here in this image i have given some of the determinants of msp which are considered by the cacp so based on all these inputs the commission finalizes its recommendation which are then submitted to the government the government in turn circulate the cacp reports to state governments and concerned central ministries for their comments after receiving the feedback from them the cabinet committee on economic affairs of the union government takes a final decision on the levels of msps and other recommendations made by the cacp and finally announces the msp the food corporation of india which is the nodal central agency of the government of india along with other state agencies undertakes procurement of crops remember the government of india sets the msp twice a year prior to sowing season that is one for rabi another for karif here the key point is that msps are declared during the sowing season see this will help the investors to make a planned investment into the crop now we'll get back to the question from a discussion we know that statement 1 is incorrect it is the ccea which sets the msp twice a year the cacp just gives the recommendation statement number 2 is correct it is one of the main objective of msp statement number 3 is also correct due to its trade distorting nature the msp is placed under the ampere box subsidy of aoa so the correct answer here is option b 2 and 3 only now we will move on to the next question see this next question is based on the global multi dimensional poverty index 2022 four statements are given and we have to find the correct statement here statement number 1 is incorrect in absolute terms india has the highest number of multi dimensionally poor people in the world in india 228.9 million people are multi dimensionally poor which is around 16.4 percentage of the total population of india india is followed by nigeria with 96.7 million nigerians who are multi dimensionally poor an additional point that you have to note here is that niger is the country with the highest number of people who are multi dimensionally poor around 91 percentage of people there are multi dimensionally poor here statement number 2 is correct india has the highest number of multi dimensionally poor children in the world around 97 million children in india are multi dimensionally poor statement 3 is also correct in the last 15 years that is between 2005 6 and 2019 21 billion indians exited or came out of poverty in the same period the incidence of poverty fell from 55.1% to 16.4% here statement number 4 is incorrect because the highest number of poorest of the poor people live in sub saharan africa followed by arab states and then south asia the order given in the statement is incorrect since statements 2 and 3 are correct the correct answer here is option b 2 and 3 only here statement 4 talks about the poorest of the poor right 
who are they to understand this better we must first have a clear idea about multidimensional poverty index see the global multidimensional poverty index constructs a deprivation profile of each household and persons through 10 indicators the 10 indicators are brought under three different categories such as health education and living standards the details about the indicators within each category are given here in this flow chart pause the video and have a look at it now coming to the calculation mechanism of deprivation score all indicators are equally weighted within each category let me explain this to you briefly the six indicators in the living standards category have equal weight assigned to them which is the same for the other indicators in the health and education category also the global multidimensional poverty index identifies people as multidimensionally poor if their deprivation score is 1 by 3 or higher a person is considered the poorest of poor when the particular person is deprived in all the 10 indicators nigeria has the highest number of people living in this category finally note that multidimensional poverty index is released annually by undp and ophi here undp stands for united nations development program and ophi stands for oxford poverty and human development initiative so with this information we will now move on to the next question see this question is about stable burning and the efforts of government in addressing this issue before solving this question we need to understand what is stable burning see stable burning refers to burning of crop leftovers particularly the crop residues of paddy like the rice straw and rice stalk farmers follow this practice as it is the cheapest way to clear the residues in the field this has been done primarily to prepare fields for the next crop which has to be sown in the window of 3 to 4 weeks from the last cultivation period the stubble burning results in the formation of smog in new delhi which in turn affects the quality of air in the national capital region now we will look at the in situ and ex situ efforts for reducing stubble burning in situ initiatives include efforts which are concentrated around and inside the field where the stubble burning takes place it includes introduction of pusa decomposer and short duration rice varieties etc let us see about these two initiatives briefly see pusa decomposer is a liquid like compound when sprayed on the stubble will lead to relatively immediate decomposition of the stubble short duration rice varieties help in increasing the time period between the karif and rabi cultivation this type of rice varieties includes pr121 pr130 and pr131 with increasing window between the cultivation and sowing of the next crop the need for burning of stubble comes down then ex situ efforts refers to initiatives which are not concentrated on the fields this includes torrefaction technique setting up of rice bio parks etc now we will see briefly about torrefaction and rice bio parks torrefaction refers to a thermal process which converts biomass into a coal like material and rice bio parks will function with paddy straw residues as a input to produce products like paper cardboard etc in both the techniques farmers are paid for their crop residues this in turn may encourage them to remove their residues without burning with this knowledge now let us solve this question we know that pusa decomposer is an example of in situ efforts whereas torrefaction and setting up rice bio parks are the example of the ex situ efforts the question asks for the in situ efforts only so the answer is option a one only now we will take up the next question look at this question here it is about taj mahal four options are given and we have to find out the incorrect statement first of all let us see some facts about taj mahal and then we will solve this question 
Taj Mahal was built by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to honor his wife Mumtaz Mahal. It is one of the seven wonders of the world. It houses the tomb of both Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan. It is located in Agra on the banks of Yamuna. The Muslim architecture takes inspiration from Indian, Persian and Arabic architecture. It is built out of white marbles from the Makrana mines from the Indian state of Rajasthan. Now let's see some important details about the structure. See, the chief architect of Taj Mahal was Ustad Ahmed Lahori. Know that Taj Mahal is located on top of an elevated square plinth that features four minarets standing at each of the four corners of the structure. The interior of the architecture was decorated with marble jelly works, calligraphy and Paithara Dura. Here, Paithara Dura is a decorative art form that involves inserting pieces of contrasting colored material into depressions in a base object to form ornament or pictures. And jelly or pierced screens involves creating perforated slabs of stones. This was done during those times to ensure air flow. One important fact you have to know here is about the mini Taj of Deccan. It is Bibi Ka Makbara. It is located in the Aurangabad district of Maharashtra. So it is the burial place of Dilras Banu Beham who is the first wife of Aurangasip, the Mughal emperor. Now let's take up the question. From what we saw just now, we know that the incorrect option is option B only. This is because it says that Taj Mahal only contains the tomb of Mumtaj Mahal. So with this, we have come to the end of the discussion. Thank you for watching the video. If you have found a video to be useful, share it with your friends. Subscribe to the channel. Happy learning.